Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Iron Coffins part 30. Port routine replaced the tension of the long patrol. Our men took care of their boat with the same affectionate devotion they showed to their girls. Siegmann went for the usual briefing with Dönitz. Afterwards, he underwent several training sessions to stay informed about the rapid developments in foreign and domestic weapons. Our dear doctor was relieved of his duty to serve on submarines and was sent to the Austrian Alps to recover from the hardships of his adventure. Leadership had finally given up on equipping submarines with doctors after a large number of them, along with their boats, had been sacrificed. Their medical skills were needed elsewhere. Innovative torpedoes were promised to us for the next patrol. To familiarize myself with them, I attended a short refresher course in Gotenhafen, a brief interlude that I awaited with great anticipation and growing hope for an improvement of the situation. Before my departure, I had just enough time to visit my tailor. He was visibly surprised to see me again, and our dilemma had, of course, not remained a secret from the French. My suit was hanging ready on a stand, and to complete my wardrobe I bought a gabardine goat, silk shirts and elegant sports shoes with crab soles. Although we were already in the fourth year of the war, the French procured everything one could desire. Without the proper brand names of course, but at the corresponding prices. I could afford to pay any price, because at sea there were neither girls nor bars nor extravagant expensive festivities. Five days after the return of U-230, I sat on the express train to Paris. I had carefully placed my civilian suit in my pigskin suitcase and upon arrival at my hotel near Place Vendôme, I transformed into a civilian. For the first time since that one day in December of 1939, when I put on the navy blue, I could set aside my uniform for a few hours. Now I could enjoy Paris. It pulsated with a lush, peaceful life. And I wished that life would always remain this way. My desire for an atmosphere of peace had grown the longer the war dragged on. I wished to join the fortunate ones who did not have to wrestle with the tormenting thoughts about tomorrow. A tomorrow filled with the roar of diesel engines and the crash of exploding water and aerial bombs ending in death in our own iron coffin. I wished just for hours to forget that I was a cog in the war machine that destroyed and crushed. I wished for a few hours to experience life as it truly was, not as a soldier, but far from the war as an innocent observer. Only one place in the world, it seemed, could give me that wonderful feeling of detachment, freedom and contemplation that I sought. Fortunately, Paris did not disappoint me. It was, as always, enchanting. I felt the charm of this city as people from many countries and times had experienced it. Free from the constraints of existence in uniform, I strolled through the streets, and I knew that my disguise was excellent when the furtive glances of those Parisian women caught me, who did not deign to notice a man in uniform. For five wonderful hours I was completely detached from the war. I had found myself again. I was back in uniform when I arrived in Frankfurt. I spent the evening with my parents and my sister. The destruction in this city had taken on grotesque proportions. Since my last visit in June, entire neighborhoods had been damaged, just like in Berlin. Father's business had suffered greatly from the attacks and had been superficially repaired. According to Father's report, the sixth fire in the attic of his warehouse had been extinguished with great difficulty just two days earlier. Our house had also suffered fire damage. These revelations were quite unsettling. Somehow I felt responsible for the many shiploads of American bombers that crossed the Atlantic unhindered and were now shattering our German cities. In essence, I was glad that my packed travel schedule allowed me only a few hours at home. That same night I left Frankfurt in a darkened train. We stopped several times in forests and open fields and each time the long deep hum of allied bombers could be heard flying across the night sky over Germany. The journey to Berlin was a torturous, exhausting affair. I arrived with an eight-hour delay. I crossed the capital with the subway, thinking of happier times. Since Marianne's death, Berlin had lost its face and attraction for me. I left the city on my familiar route to the Baltic coast with an additional delay of six hours. A second miserable night on the rails. The only illumination came from the flickering matches and the glowing tips of cigars and cigarettes. Smoke and stench polluted the crowded compartments. 
lively discussions about the war situation kept soldiers and civilians awake, and I was deeply impressed by the spirit of our people at home and the attitude of our soldiers returning to the Eastern Front. The express train arrived in Danzig with a 10-hour delay. I had to change trains again and finally arrived in Gotenhafen with a total delay of one day. I noticed a certain excitement among the submariners who had gathered here to be informed about the first fundamental change in submarine warfare since the introduction of radar. A practical demonstration of new torpedoes was scheduled for the night. The Bay of Danzig was shrouded in complete darkness. The night was mild. I had boarded a medium-sized motorship that, before the war, had seen better days as an elegant passenger steamer between German and Swedish ports. The vessel came to a stop in the middle of the bay, the water was shallow and calm. The chief of the torpedo testing station invited his guests to the promenade deck and said, Gentlemen, today we will demonstrate two torpedoes to you that will revolutionize submarine warfare. First, we will show you the performance of the destroyer cracker T5. The T5 is an acoustically driven torpedo of the highest potential. Afterwards, we will demonstrate the LUT torpedo with its versatile applications. Both torpedoes are electrically powered and for the purpose of this demonstration they are equipped with luminous heads. You can thus follow the serpent-like movements of the eels and observe their accuracy. The motorship began to move. Minutes later I saw a shimmering green light approaching us in the dark waters of the bay. Our vessel swung hard to port. The light followed. Then the steamer turned to starboard. The light changed course again and followed. A very ghostly affair. The luminous torpedo steadily reduced the distance. The motor ship tried to shake off the pursuer with wild zigzag movements, but the eerie light glided through the water, steadfastly followed, closed the distance and passed beneath the stern of the ship. That was the moment when the magnetic detonation of a live warhead would have occurred. In our case, however, the practice torpedo maintained its old course for a few seconds, then turned, shot ahead of the steamer, described a circle, attacked the ship a second time, undercut the keel, made a new elegant turn and undertook the ship for a third time before its batteries were depleted. Then it surfaced like a dead fish and the light in its head glowed brightly in the water. This was an astonishing demonstration. I realized that we had a weapon here that would revolutionize the fight against the new fast destroyers and corvettes. This presentation was followed by a second one, equally impressive. A number of torpedoes with luminous heads crossed the dark bay with long and short surge strokes. Soon the surface was covered with numerous torch-like lights that continually intersected, ran away, turned, returned and repeated the game until their batteries too were depleted. Enthralled by this new weapon, I followed the three-day course like a young cat waiting to dry out its claws. The so-called destroyer cracker T5 was equipped with a listening device that responded to the opponent's propeller noises. If the target was stationary, the highly sensitive device picked up the sound of the auxiliary motors. It sufficed to fire the torpedo in the general direction of the opponent. The listening device then found the source of the noise and guided the torpedo towards the enemy vessel regardless of whether it tried to escape at high speed or with hard rudder movements. The second addition to our torpedo arsenal had a different application. It had become increasingly difficult to approach enemy ships at favorable firing range, so the new LUT torpedo was designed to bridge this gap. It could be launched from a great distance from the convoy. It could then be fired against or with the course of the steamship columns in long or short loops. A four-pack with alternating long and short surge loops could thus create an effective barricade within a convoy, promising high hit probabilities. It was no longer necessary to break through the close protection of a formation to shoot with precision. I left Gotenhafen excited about the new weapon and filled with rumors about other developments. I had heard about miracle submarines undergoing trials and lying in the havens of our shipyards, boats that could continuously travel submerged and could no longer be detected by enemy aircraft, boats with an underwater speed that matched our current maximum surface speed. Another development were new snorkels equipped with a retractable mast, a snorkel that allowed them to draw fresh air into the boat at periscope depth and at the same time recharge the batteries. This device seemed so vital to me for our old boats that I decided to immediately examine the possibility of installing the snorkel in our boat type upon my return to base. For the first time in months I felt that Dönitz was finally offering us the means with which we could risk our lives somewhat meaningfully and bring about a turning point in our naval struggle. 
The air raid sirens wailed as I arrived in Berlin and the stench of cordite and smoldering fires filled the air as I left Berlin. The night express train to Paris was again unlit and packed with fleeing people. Europe was burning, Europe was in a fiery turmoil. The front was everywhere, in the cities, in the villages, in the hearts of the bombed out frightened refugees and the homeless who overcrowded the trains. Five hours east of Paris, I met Marguerite. She had boarded in chalon sur marne In the darkness, I saw only a little of her face, but smelled a perfume sold in every salon on Boulevard Ousmane. At first, it was just politeness as I lifted her luggage into the luggage net. Later, as the dim lamps of a small train station illuminated her face for a few seconds, I did not see many things, but I saw that she was really pretty. At first, we spoke about meaningless things, but then she told me that she was from Saint-Denis, a northern suburb of Paris. She said, Paris without Saint-Denis is like wine without alcohol. She promised to show me Saint-Denis, and she did, and the next morning. After breakfast, we went straight to Paris. The sun was high in the sky as we checked into my hotel near Place Vendôme, but it was already dark and time for dinner when we left the room. We had a gourmet meal at a Brasserie Vale, then strolled along Boulevard Montmartre and spent the rest of the evening in Tabarin. The next morning we walked through the autumnal parks, smelling strongly of wilting leaves. I promised Marguerite that I would return to her and Paris if the sea freed me again. As we kissed goodbye, she cried, and I went back to my war. The base in Brest was in great excitement. The radio had just announced the capitulation of Italy. The news was the subject of heated discussion in the mess halls and at the bar of the flotilla. After English-American divisions had formed a new bridgehead at Salerno, threatening Rome, Badoglio had ordered Italian soldiers to lay down their weapons. This forced our troops in Italy to resist the enemy alone. Fortunately, our lines seemed to hold the onslaught. But it was clear that the steel ring around the fortress of Europe was narrowing. During the first meal in the harbor, I learned more depressing news. Strohmeyer, a staff officer of the flotilla, reported that three comrades had remained at sea. Another had been crushed when the forward battery of his boat exploded. In the Atlantic, he had been given the usual sailor's burial. Soon, into the sleeping bag and equipped with weights, they had let him slide overboard. And then Strohmeyer came out with the news that Gerloff and Goebel, my comrades on U-557, had embarked on their eternal journey as well. I wished Strohmeyer a good evening and went into the adjacent room. At the bar, a small group of indestructibles sat, who had also escaped once more. There was Riedel with his Menju mustache, a reminder of his many clean-shaven voyages. There were others, like Stromberg, Burg and me, who had succeeded in returning to Brest. I settled on a high bar stool, drank and sang to forget. We sang more or less melodically through our entire repertoire of sea shanties, while Burg pounded on the tunes on the piano the chorus of our version of the well-known soldier's song, Lily Marlene. As often happens when the gin fizz no longer tasted good and patience or ingenuity ran out, we decided to pay a visit to Madame and her girls at the casino bar. I squeezed into the overcrowded car and drove with the others through the darkened city. The casino bar was, as always, loud, smoky and brightly lit. Some comrades from the first U-boat flotilla downed their strong drinks at the bar, shouted words of greeting or made sarcastic remarks about our intrusion. Madame greeted me as charmingly as ever, but with a hint of reproach. Monsieur, we haven't seen you in a long time. I hope my girls haven't treated you poorly. No, Madame, it was not your fault, it was... I paused, because her house could be an allied information center and said only... It was the tides that carried me away, madame. Sit too. I sat at the bar, sipped a cognac, listened to the blaring gramophone music and watched amused as my friends danced recklessly through the rooms. And then suddenly I felt that none of this mattered to me anymore and that the casino bar had lost its allure. Shortly after midnight, the air raid sirens began to wail. My friends rushed out of the rooms on the upper floors, loosened their ties and threw their jackets over their shoulders. Of course, they were neither impressed nor intimidated by what was to come. They simply wanted to avoid being found in the ruins of the casino bar. It would have brought them undesirable obituaries. The sirens wailed loudly and insistently as we hurried through the dark streets to the base. 
I heard the deep tolling of the heavy flak coming from the direction of Cosson. The bombers were already over the city. We rushed into a public air raid shelter and I stood at the entrance and stared into the night blue sky where the exploding shells flashed. I observed that the main thrust of the attack was directed towards the side of Brest, saw six or seven planes catch fire, break away from the formation and crash in graceful arcs, trailing long comet streaks behind them. The significantly reinforced flak around Brest provided such a grand spectacle that I completely forgot to seek shelter. But then calm returned. The bomber formation had flown towards Lorient. The nocturnal events turned us wide awake again. No one thought of going to sleep. We gathered in the flotilla bar and ordered more champagne. I was just settling into one of the bar stools when the door flew open and someone shouted, The Americans are coming! Everyone, get up! After the Allied landing in Sicily and Italy, anything was possible, but the staff lieutenant who brought us the news so eagerly quickly added, Don't get nervous. I just wanted to say that the shot down American flyers are being brought to the hospital. Do you want to see them? The night became increasingly interesting. I rushed to the nearby naval hospital. The square in front of the hospital was bathed in daylight by numerous arc lamps, despite the airborne danger. Trucks and ambulances continuously arrived. Nurses, aides and onlookers crowded around the vehicles at the entrance. The victims of our flak, some severely burned, were being carried in on stretchers. A doctor I knew allowed me to enter the treatment room. One of the Yankees, still wearing his brown leather aviator jacket, seemed to be in somewhat better condition than his comrades. He rolled his eyes and turned his head, clearly in pain. A nasty but superficial wound ran from his forehead over the head to the neck, neatly dividing his scalp into two halves. His haircut was short, like that of a Prussian soldier around the turn of the century. Facing my first opponent at such close quarters, I felt compelled to ask him some questions. I said, now you see, that's what you get for trying to hit our U-boat bases. The American preferred to remain silent. I tried again. Are you in pain? Still no answer. I persisted. Tell me, how'd you get this wound? Now he moved his head slightly, surprised that an opponent showed concern for his condition. Then he said, well, must have been injured when I bailed out the cockpit. My plane was hit. It wasn't fire. The crew had already bailed out, but I couldn't get out of the cockpit. The canopy was jammed. I banged my head against it several times until it broke open and flew off. I must have been injured during that. I don't know how I came down. His broad American accent impressed me, as I had learned British English in school. So I finally said, well, that means the end of the war for you. Aren't you grateful that it's over? And he just replied, the war may be over for me, but it will be over for you soon, too. A foreboding message from this American airman. And with this we come to the after action report. A bit of R&R &R for Herbert in this one and most of all he's being instructed in the usage of new torpedoes. The first one is the so-called Zaunkönig T5 or G7ES, an early version of an acoustic homing torpedo that was intended to be launched from the aft tube towards pursuing destroyers. This torpedo was equipped with a passive sensor that was rather primitive by today's standards of course, but pretty sensitive back then. In fact, it was so sensitive that it tended to either pick up the screw noises of the boat where it was launched from, turn around and sink it, or detonate way too early when approaching target ships. It became standard practice to immediately dive to 60 meters after launching the torpedo to prevent a circle runner. The other one was the so-called Lage Unabhängiger Torpedo, a torpedo that was supposed to be fired from great distance and from any angle towards convoys. The earlier version, the so-called FAT, Flächenabsuch Torpedo or Area Searching Torpedo, still had to be shot from a 90 degree angle towards the target and it would then do search patterns. The LUT had a second gyro and could be launched from any angle. Whether this will have any effect on future missions, we shall find out soon enough and I will see you then. Cheers, bye bye.